a warm welcome to each and every one of you to the <clears throat> webinar named learn from the legends organized by indian academy of pediatrics neonatology chapter and national neonatology forum kerala and indian academy of pediatrics thrissur branch today i am delighted to welcome professor vivek narendra director city hospital nicu perinat institute cincinnati ohio usa who will speak to us on ontogeny of preterm skin and its clinical implications to moderate this session we have two eminent neonatologist from india professor saurabh datta from pgi chandigarh india and dr dhananjay from jaipur india over to you dr manoj vc for further proceedings and introduction of the eminent faculty we have today thank you thank you sir hello everyone welcome to today's session of learn from the legends we have with us another legend dr vivek narendran he is a professor in clinical pe pediatrics and neonatology at cincinnati children's hospital medical center attached university of cincinnati we all know cincinnati children's is one of the largest hospital in us uh, in, it is in fact ranked number 4 in nation among the honor roll hospitals in us news and world reports 20 uh, 21 22 and in fact just now uh, he was telling us it is the second largest in the country best children's hospital rating all the time and he is the director of the show the director of nicu uh, following the footstep of the legend whom we had the fortune to hear before professor alan job now uh, dr vivek narendran uh, is a board certified pediatrician and neonatologist with extensive clinical and research experience over the last 25 years he trained for his md and dnb at india and three year fellowship in australia and then uh, he trained in united kingdom for his mrcp uh, all this prior to his residency and fellowship in neonatology at cincinnati professor narendran also surprisingly has another side of himself he has a business degree mba from sevier university with a focus in health economics something new for some of us and he was just now talking to us about why we should be aware of the health economics we all know professor narendran for his research interest in respiratory care non invasive ventilation bpd prevention clinical qa interest uh, part of being support trial oxygen saturation trial etc he is a well known speaker in neonatal respiratory medicine but what is not known to many is his unique contribution to neonatal skin development and adaptation neonatal dermatology basic science role of vernix and taking it further to the multiomics the proteomics genomics of neonatal skin and comparing it with adult skin he has an extensive interesting work on this which is not known to many of us that's why he is going to talk to us today about this not about respiratory care his current involvement in multi site clinical trials include cycle phototherapy for elbw babies the bip trial studying combination of surfactant and budesonide to prevent bpd something he is going to talk to us after 3 weeks in the uh, international neonatology summit iap neocon 2022 and another trial coconut oil emollient therapy in vlbw infants in indian nicu to prevent sepsis 
aimed at looking at mechanisms of protection at a cellular and molecular level skin research evaluating genomic and proteomic differences at different gestational ages in preterm infants very very interesting areas which none of us have explored he is an authority on most of this that's why we have him today he originally hails from bangalore and has been actively involved in neonatal education in india nnf conferences uh, other education activities in different states over the last 15 years but today i would like to present professor vivek narendran as the authority on neonatal dermatology over to you vivek thank you manoj thank you for that kind introduction and welcoming me and inviting me to take part in these webinar series let me start sharing my screen can you all see it yes sir we can see it please go ahead so good evening good morning wherever you are so i'm pleased to be here this evening with you all my title for the talk today is ontogeny of the preterm skin and its clinical implications so when i talk about ontogeny i'm just going to talk about how an organ matures or develops okay i'm not going to be talking about pathology of the skin or dermatology so one second So before I get started, I wanted to arouse your curiosity and I want you to think through these questions. Are there some structures or organs in the neonate which are the size of an adult? Does the number of melanocytes determine the different skin color in different races? Is pH of the babies different from adults and is it important? And do you think phototherapy is safe in extremely low birth weight babies? I want you to mull over these questions and hopefully you'll have answers by the end of the end of my talk. So let me start with a brief introduction to the anatomy of the skin. This is essentially the epidermis primarily and the area that you interact with every day is the stratum corneum which is the outermost layer of the epidermis. The epidermis has been segmented into different layers and both you know anatomically as well as functionally. It starts off from basale, stratum basale, to the stratum corneum. And then here below in the dermis, you have the vasculature and all the glands that are important to us. So if you look at the dermis, you have the sebaceous glands, which outpour their secretion sebum into the hair follicle. And then the sebum is extruded out to the surface along the hair shaft. The sweat gland is interesting. It's an eccrine sweat gland, which has its own pore, which opens on the skin surface. The skin starts developing, meaning the process of keratinization starts around 16 weeks. So I want you to remember the second trimester. And then it starts around the hair follicle and then spreads outwards. The stratum corneum is only formed around 24 weeks. So even though it's just a layer or two, it's formed around 24 weeks. So if your baby's younger than that, they don't have that. That's why the skin is so translucent and transparent and gelatinous. If you look at the, the nerve endings, they're also, they are, some are in the epidermis and some are in the dermis. And then if you look at this area, the dermal papillae and the retay pigs, Retay pegs, they are the ones that help in the cohesion of the epidermis and the dermis. And those are not well developed till the baby is almost 34 weeks. So these babies, are, babies less than 30 weeks are particularly susceptible to injuries related to epidermal stripping if they're less than 30 weeks. If you look at the function of the preterm skin, I won't preterm skin, I won't go into the details, it's primarily a barrier barrier to physical things like different irritants and toxins to uv light the melanocytes play a big role in that immunological the langerhans cells play a role the langerhans cells are very similar to macrophages then of course all the sensory nerves involved with touch pressure and vibration and then thermal regulation in the term newborn only after about third 
day, you will find some thermal sweating, which helps in temperature regulation. There is also an element called emotional sweating in term babies, which happens primarily in the palms and the soles, but not seen very commonly in preterm babies. The thermal sweating happens primarily that you see when babies are put under the radiant warmer, you see the sweating on the forehead, the face, the back, and the front. Whereas the emotional sweating, which happens to relate, which is related to pain, usually happens in the palms and the soles. And coming to acid mantle development, I'll talk about it later during clinical implications. So the question that interested me the most about how I got into this area of research is, if you know, if you put your hands in water for five, 10 minutes, you know how your hand gets, the skin gets wrinkled or it's called goose skin. But here you have a fetus who's submerged in water, basically amniotic fluid, for nine months and then comes out with pristine looking skin, right? So he's like in a bathtub peeing and pooping and comes out with good looking skin. And the answer we believe is vernix caseosa. In Latin, vernix means to varnish and caseosa means cheese-like. And this substance coats the fetus and provides a hydrophobic film all around to help the skin develop beneath it. So vernix is primarily an outpouring of the sebaceous gland, which is sebum. So it's essentially sebum with desquamated corneocytes and some stem cells from the hair follicle. So primarily sebum, and then it has some cells which are corneocytes. So if the baby has to produce that much amount of sebum to cover the entire baby, the sebaceous gland is hypertrophic. These are hypertrophic sebaceous glands that we see in term newborns. This is sometimes confused as milia. And sebaceous glands are much, much, much more common than milia. Milia are more like keratogenous cysts that you see, like the Epstein spurs that you see on the heart palate. The milia is sort of less, you know, they're not, they're not, they are cysts, but they are smaller, they are yellower, and they're a little more sparse. So, but these are, sebaceous gland, which is hypertrophy. The mechanism that this happens in utero is that both the placenta and the hypothalamus produce corticotropin releasing factor, which acts on the pituitary, and then the pituitary, you know, uh, gives rise to ACTH, and then the ACTH is constantly stimulating the adrenal gland, and the adrenal gland produces a mild androgen known as DHEA, which acts on the sebaceous gland to pump the sebum and sebum to cover the uh, surface of the fetus. To do this, the adrenal glands are all hypertrophied. So at birth, the hypertrophied adrenal glands are the size of an adult gland. And then if you see throughout the gestation, it keeps becoming bigger and bigger. And then at birth, it starts involuting because it doesn't, it, it doesn't have that ongoing stimulation. And then it's dormant for a while, then at, pituitary, at, at puberty it goes up a little bit and then reaches adult size again. So what is the composition of this vernix? When you touch and feel the vernix, you know, this thick viscous material, you feel it's just like fat. But interestingly, it's 80% water and only 10% is lipids and 10% are fats. So we, we did this to prove this. We do something known as dry weight, wet weight ratios and compared it to other commonly used NICU creams. And you can clearly see vernix is primarily 80% water. If you look at the lipid composition, it's primarily made of cholesterol esters and ceramides. I'll come back to ceramides, this green segment here, because these are all brown chain fatty acids, which have a role both not only in the vernix, but has a role in the postnatal skin as well. The amino acids, I want to bring your attention to glutamine, which is the most abundant, one of the most abundant in, in vernix. Glutamine is one of the most abundant amino acids in plasma and breast milk. In the adult world, glutamine enriched TPN has found to decrease sepsis in critically ill adults. But we did a similar study in neonates, in the neonatal intensive care in very low birth weight babies to see if TPN supplementation with glutamine decreased sepsis, but it did not in our population, so we don't routinely use it. So at the time of birth, what happens is, as the lung is maturing in utero, the fetal lung starts producing surfactant. So this surfactant, surfactants are nothing but they are like, you know, what is present in soaps and detergents, they are used to remove dirt. 
So this surfactant actually removes the vernix from the skin surface, helps it detach like this. And then vernix is free floating in the amniotic fluid and then it is swallowed by the fetal gut. And this we believe is the first nutrient that the baby swallows or is, uh, the GI tract is exposed to prior to postnatal, postnatal feeding. This is a fascinating physiology by itself. You know, these are three epithelial surfaces, the lung epithelium, the skin epithelium, and the gut epithelium. Remember, these are the three epithelial surfaces that are exposed to the environment. And they are interacting already in utero. This is a simple experiment we showed, uh, we did to show that the vernix detaches. On the x-axis is surfactant. This is bovine surfactant. On the y-axis is optical density. So we take a simple tube, uh, we call it centrifuge tubes, coated with vernix, and then we put different concentrations of surfactant and then show that the vernix detaches. But if the vernix does not detach, if you just use just phospholipids, you need the active ingredients in bovine surfactant, which is surfactant protein A and T, to facilitate this activity or detachment. Then you're born. You know, this poor fetus was being an aquatic being, suddenly becomes a terrestrial being. Now he's exposed to all the hazards of this new environment. But unfortunately, he doesn't have this kind of a coating that some of our friends in the animal kingdom have. So we believe that one ex at least transiently, you know, provides all these functions. So here are the list of things that we believe one ex does. And I'll try and give you a little bit of proof that we obtained so to support this hypothesis. So let's look at waterproofing layer. We measure something known as the wettability index or the critical surface tension. Essentially what we do is we take a slide coated with vernix and put a drop of water on it. And if it's really a hydrophobic material, it should beat up. But if the contact angle is zero that we measure, then that means it's not hydrophobic. So we found that doing simple experiments like that, that it is very hydrophobic. But the thing which is most interesting was this one. Rheology is the study of how things flow. I mean, this is very important in the cosmetic industry. For example, how, does the, how do the cosmetics flow and are spread on the skin surface, our lipstick, or whatever it is. So essentially, what we did is we take, you know, essentially, if you handle vernix, it is so thick and gooey and viscous, right? You know, you, it's hard to understand how it spreads and covers the fetus. So we applied a certain amount of stress and then looked to see how much it moves or what is the shear rate. And at different temperatures, we realized as body temperature, vernix just easily flows and moves. That is the reason because in utero, the baby, the vernix is body temperature, hence it can flow and cover the fetus. Anti-infective barrier. So does the vernix have any anti-infective molecules, whether related to amino acids or the fatty acids? So we look to see if the babies had collectins or other anti-infective peptides. Collectins are essentially surfactant protein A and D, which are antibacterial and antiviral. And then we also wanted to look to see if it had lysozyme, lactoferrin, and other defensins, et cetera, which are all antimicrobial peptides. In this example here, we show you a foreskin. You know, circumcisions, circumcisions are very common in this country. So we take foreskin, and then we look at the sebaceous gland and use specific antibodies uh, to SPD, which is the collectin, and then immunolocalize it to the sebaceous gland to show that it's there in the sebum. Similarly, in vernix, we use antibodies to show that it has lysozyme, lactoferrin, and cytokeratin. And it, it seems to be found in such pools or aggregates. We think these, we call them ready release granules in times of stress or an insult like choriamnonitis, it's there to be released. So we wanted to also make sure that it's just not there, but it's also functional. So we take bacteria and, and put it, you know, grow it in culture media and then expose it to a fixed amount of vernix and showed that it's very effective in its bactericidal effect against a group B streptococcus, Klebsiella, and Listeria. So we also looked at some pro and anti-inflammatory cytokines. You know all this. So we had, we showed that the vernix also has a whole bunch of cytokines. I'm not sure the significance of its presence, but we believe that it may be related to a systemic infl inflammatory response that happens when a baby is exposed to choriamnionitis. 
Now coming to the vernix fatty acids, it has a very potent anti-inflammatory anti role. These were all done in in vitro experiments or in animal models. For example, in a rat model, they showed if the feeds are enriched with branched chain fatty acids, then it can decrease neck in these rat models. Then if you take a human intestinal epithelial explant, you know, in vitro, if it's pretreated at vernix and then expose it to a toxin like endotoxin, but the amount of inflammation you see is totally less. It has very suppressed pro-inflammatory activity like IL-8 and NF-kappa-B. So essentially these branched chain fatty acids seems to have a very protective anti-inflammatory role. What about antioxidant? Remember the fetus is growing in a relatively hypoxic environment. The PaO2 of a fetus is somewhere between 25 to 30 millimeters of mercury. But when the baby comes out, his FiO2 goes up to 90 to 100 millimeters of mercury. So that's a huge oxidant stress. So we wanted to see if there are any antioxidants in Vernix and we found the presence of vitamin E. And vitamin E, you know, is a potent antioxidant. What about moisturizers? Remember the fetus was in a wet, it's warm and a humid environment in utero, suddenly it comes out of this new world, which is dry and uh, it's cold. So the baby needs something to keep the skin moist and well hydrated. So we found that the vernix has something known as natural moisturizing factors. Filagrin is a protein which essentially binds as a structural protein which binds together corneocytes. So this undergoes proteolysis when exposed to a low humidity environment and releases these, uh, these uh, factors known as natural moisturizing factors. So this natural moisturizing factor is the one which prevents this kind of desquamation that we come see sometimes in, in our post-term babies. So we, want, we did a simple experiment on adult forearms and we basically, we have equipment which can, we can use to measure some biophysical measurements. We applied vernix and other commonly used creams in the NICU, like petrolatum is nothing but Vaseline, Aquaphor, you all know. And then we showed that the vernix treated forearm had increased hydration, baseline hydration, as well as water holding capabilities, again, suggesting that it is a moisturizer. So we did a, we took a group of, similarly, we took a group of newborns who had vernix retained, whereas, and compared it to a group of term babies who were given a bath, bath soon after birth and showed again, using the same kind of biophysical measurements that the skin was more hydrated, this dark blue, I mean, light blue was much more hydrated when the vernix was on, the skin was less erythematous and had lower skin pH. What about a cleanser? Because these newborns are not meant to be born in a fancy uh, delivery suite. They were meant to be born out in the woods. So we did a very simple experiment. We took the uh, old photocopying machines, the carbon suit from that, and we put it on the hands of adults and then tried to clean it with one swipe. We compared all the other common cleansers that we use in the NICU and found that the vernix, that's the first panel, seems to clean better than a Johnson & Johnson shampoo or you know, the baby wash that we use or the Pond's cold cream or Aquaphor. So we think it is because of this unique lipid composition of the vernix that helps in emulsifying and cleaning this, goes inside and cleans this deep skin furrows that you can wipe off the dirt. What about wound healing agent? So we are one of the centers where we do fetal surgeries. For example, we do a meningomyelocele repair at 24 weeks. We do the surgery and put the fetus back into the uterus in the amniotic fluid. And when the babies are born at term, we noticed that this babies had a beautiful scar, a well-healed scar. There was no dehiscence. So we wondered if this vernix had some sort of a growth factors or something else that facilitated wound healing. So we initially did this on a newborn pig model, caused an injury model using a erbium laser and caused injury and tried to put some different dressings or, uh, or creams like you know, uh, Vaseline compared it to vernix and no treatment, but we didn't find any significant difference. Then we went on to do it on a hairless mice model, did a similar thing of, of creating an injury. 
But then we showed that the vernix, which is this blue ones, had a greater percent of barrier recovery when compared to petrolatum. Petrolatum skin also showed some you know, uh, better improvement compared to no treatment, but the skin was, didn't look too normal. It was much more erythematous and thickened compared to vernix, which was more like a normal looking barrier. Then we did the same experiment. We took vernix and applied it onto the forearm of the baby's own mother, because obviously for concerns of risk of infection. The injury model we did here was we take a cellophane tape and keep applying it onto the same site multiple times. You put it and strip it, you put it and take it out. So you keep removing the different layers, multiple layers of stratum cornea. So the way we know we have stripped enough is we would have measured a baseline transepidermal water loss. And we know now that the water loss has increased to four times the baseline that there is an injury. And then we apply different treatments, whether it's dressings or creams. For example, I want you to concentrate on this semi-permeable membrane. And then we, of course, we tried vernix and of course, petrolatum, which is Vaseline. And then we found the most interesting part that I'll come back and address this is that the semi-permeable mem membrane seemed to have the best percent barrier recovery, okay? The rest didn't differentiate as much between them, between themselves. This is another group which tried to do the same experiment with synthetic vernix. Synthetic vernix meaning it's, it's a cream which has the same kind of lipid mixture that vernix has. They did the same kind of experiment on adult forearms. Here, the synthetic vernix was enriched with ceramides. Remember I told you vernix was, uh, you know, had a huge amount of ceramides in it. And then they did the same thing and they, looked to see the percent barrier recovery and found that the synthetic vernix with this uh, vernix, which is supplemented with extra ceramides seem to improve our uh, help and seem to help with barrier recovery when compared to no treatment. What about environmental toxins? Does it absorb environmental toxins? So this study was done in Japan. They took a bunch of uh, pregnant women who were exposed to dioxins. Dioxins are polychlor you know, polychlorinated biphenyls, which are very potent toxins to a developing fetus. These women were exposed to this via contaminated rice. And then they found that there was a lot of this dioxin and vernix. If you take if the mother is exposed and if you take the maternal blood as 100% of the maximum value, meaning if you think that would be where the most of the dioxin would be, it was surprising when compared to all these other organs, the vernix are almost 50% of the maternal level, suggesting that it is being secreted out of the sebaceous gland into the sebum, into the vernix, meaning vernix is acting or facilitating an excretion of this toxin. To give this, toxin a context, given that the, all of you are following the Ukraine war. Remember the previous president before Zelensky, you know, a few years ago, he was poisoned in the suburbs of London. He was actually poisoned with dioxin and they proved that it was dioxin by analyzing his sebum. So in summary, I've shown you that Vernix is a natural multifunctional skin cream that is very important in transitioning or facilitating the transition for a neonate. It has anti-infective properties, but today, since I'm gonna be talking about clinical implications in extremely low birth weight babies, these are not there. So be aware, the baby doesn't have these anti-infective molecules on the skin surface. And all the other things that I showed you about vernix and its functions support the suggestion by uh, the recommendation by WHO to retain vernix after birth and to delay bathing. Now the baby is born. The question we wanted to ask was, when does this baby develop a mature barrier like an adult? Is there a specific biomarker which can say, if present says that the barrier is now competent or mature? So we did some targeted proteomic uh, analysis, meaning we have a novel technique of uh, sampling the stratum corneum or the outermost layer of the uh, preterm baby skin. We call this d squames. So we looked at a bunch of proteins. I told, we already discussed filaggrin. So we looked at filaggrin and we looked at it at birth and at two to three months in three different groups of babies, preterm babies, late preterm babies, and full-term babies to see if it was different. 
again, I mean, it was high in both groups, no difference between these three groups. NMF, which is the moisturizer I was talking about, is initially low as expected and went up at two to three months later. But again, no, we could not differentiate the three groups. Similarly, we looked at protease inhibitors, our enzyme regulators, our some proteins which inhibit bacterial enzymes. Again, in these three groups, they were low at birth, as expected, increased two to three months later, but no difference, meaning there was nothing to suggest that it is a marker of maturity. Likewise, antimicrobial peptides, antimicrobial proteins were low, but increased two to three months later, but between the three groups, no difference. So then we went on to do some transcriptomics profiling and gene set enrichment analysis. This is gene expression between infants and adults. Primarily, we're trying to see if there is something unique about a mature barrier or uh, adult skin. So we had two groups of adults. These were two groups of adults. One, they're in the 20 age, 20 to 25 years old. The other was a little older, about in their 60s. So one representing parents, the other rep representing grandparents. And then we compared them to neonates. These were all neonates who were undergoing surgery immediately after birth within the first month. We took a full thickness biopsy prior to them uh, undergoing whatever surgery they were undergoing. The adults, we took skin biopsies from the gluteal region because we, because we wanted skin which was not exposed to ultraviolet light. So we found over 10,000 distinct genes which were differentially expressed in infants compared to adults. The genes that were upregulated were those involved in extracellular matrix and collagen organization and fatty acid metabolism, whereas in adults, it was related to epidermal maturation and immune function and differentiation. This is not surprising, given that these extracellular matrix genes are involved in processes such as cell proliferation, differentiation, adhesion, migration, et cetera, which are all important when the barrier is getting built. And it's also as important in developing the cohesion between the dermis and the epidermis that I was telling you about and in wound healing. Whereas the adult genes are involved in processes that are important in the continued renewal and replacement of the epidermis. The epidermis, you know, they said the keratinocytes constantly differentiate, mature, go up and become corneocytes and then get des desquamated. So the adult genes were, were controlling all that. And of course, they were involved in antigen processing and in adaptive immunity. So now let me go into the part that you're all waiting on. That is the, what is the clinical implications for an extremely low birth weight baby? So I'll talk a little bit briefly about neonatal skin assessments. Then I'll talk about how do we optimize skin care to manage fluid and electrolytes. Then talk about something known as MARCI, which is the adhesive related skin injury. Then we'll talk about uh, emollients to see if it works, then talk about what type of skin disinfectants to use, and a little bit about the importance of acid mantle development and talk about phototherapy. So let's talk about preterm skin assessment. We have to assess the skin. Sometimes we don't assess the skin because we're so interested in the other organ system. We are sometimes more interested, not sometimes, most often interested in the ventilator settings rather than looking at the preterm skin. Unless you assess the skin, you won't know when the barrier has been damaged or if there is a treatment that you've applied to the skin, if it is working. So there are many validated scoring systems available. The most commonly one is known as the neonatal skin condition score, which was uh, you know, promoted by a nursing association in the US known as Avon. I think the Indian Academy of Pediatrics and NNF has also adopted that score. We use something known as, which I call the Vischer score. Essentially, all these are validated scoring system. They pick a region in the body. Here, we are looking at a perianal region. Then we looked at the extent of involvement. Is it less than 2% of that region, 2 to 10, or 10 to 50, greater than 50? We look at erythema, the severity of the erythema. Then we look at the rash and the severity level of the rash and come up with a score. And we have these kinds of numerical scores essentially based on extent of involvement and severity. 
And then in our hospital, we have incorporated this skin assessment within our electronic medical records. We use Epic, the system is known as Epic. And so the nurses, all they have to do is to go and click, 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 see, go to a region and see if they see a, a problem, they go and click these things very easily. They know, you know, there's a selection form like that, that you can see. And then the computer does everything else. The computer calculates and records the chart. So every eight hours when they do cares, I have a score on the skin. So when the nurses tell me their Athema score is 1.5, I know that the perianal region was probably looking like this. And when they score their Athema score was four, I know the perianal region was looking like this with bleeding and there's erosions in the skin. So it's very helpful. And how do we use it? We look at this data and here on the x-axis is days of life. And then on the y is erythema score. You know, the younger the preterm, usually there's no rash. I'm still talking about the perianal area. Perianal area. Remember the younger they are, they don't school, stool for much longer time. Then you see the onset of sometimes a rash. Then somebody applies some sort of a barrier cream. Then we know if it's increasing or decreasing. So. This helps you, all this kind of assessment helps you in early identification as well as to know if your treatment is effective. So I strongly encourage all of you to use some form of skin assessment. Now, what do we do to manage fluid and electrolyte balance? There are two things. Remember I'm talking about extremely low birth weight babies here. Right, you have two fluid losses, one from the skin because there is very high transepidermal water loss. And then number two, you have these immature kidneys which are not able to concentrate urine. The tubules don't have the concentrating ability. So, using, so you're losing a lot of fluid through the skin and a lot of fluid through the kidney. So if you want just to go back to anatomy in an extremely preterm baby, you may have at least one or two layers of the stratum corneum. And that's why your skin looks so thin, gelatinous and transparent, facilitating transepidermal water loss. So if you look at, and if you plot the transepidermal water loss on the y-axis and the gestation on the x-axis, you'll see the younger the gestation, the higher the transepidermal loss. You're all aware of this fact. And if you see, this is just a cartoon illustrating the same. This is an extremely low birth weight baby. These blue dots are all the water molecules escaping. This is transepidermal water loss through a non lamellar lipid compared to a term infant who's got much more organized uh, lipids as well as much less water vapor. So are the uh, water molecules. Remember that the more younger in gestation you are, your body has a lot more extracellular fluid and this extracellular fluid is also coming out. So now let's look at transepidermal water loss. The uh, shaded bars here are for a baby roughly 22 to 23 weeks. I've taken an extreme example. And on the y-axis is grams per square meter per hour of water loss. It's very high on day one or two. And then the interesting thing is by one week, it drops down by 50%. The same thing happens, the dotted line is for a little bigger baby, 24 to 25 weeks. It starts off high, then drops by a week. So what this is suggesting is that the skin matures like every other organ in the neonate, like the lung, the kidney, that the postnatal maturation is pretty fast and efficient. So it, it dramatically decreases by the end of one week. So now when you're dealing with this extreme preterm baby, and you know, especially the periviable infants, we have two strategies to deal with the the, to deal with, to decrease the transepidermal water loss or to deal with uh, this loss both from the kidney and the skin. Either we use a humidified incubator and humidify it almost up to 70, 80% or we put the baby under the radiant warmer. So when I say a radiant warmer, most institutions which use a radiant warmer also put something on top of the baby a sort of a plastic shield, a saran wrap or something to decrease convective heat loss. So under that, you know, the saran wrap, you still have about 40, 50% humidity. And how does that affect fluid and electrolyte? So these are calculated values pretty close to what happens in real life if you take a 23 weeker. So on day one to three, you have transepidermal water losses almost up to 200 ml per kilo per day. Okay, that is huge. On top of that, you add additional fluid losses from your kidney. 
And for those of you practicing neonatologists, starting a baby with 250 to 300 ml per kilo per day is not uncommon, right? But it's a lot of fluid. But if you use the closed incubators, meaning with humidified incubators, the fluid loss is much, much less, right? Almost less than half on day one to three. And then over the, the first week, it decreases, but still significantly less over a radiant warmer, which is the shaded squares up here. So I want you to remember this. This is in, as we use in clinical practice, ML per kilo per day, the fluid loss that happens. So we wanted to see what different institutions who have good outcomes in taking care of these extreme preterm babies do in terms of fluid requirements. Iowa is a center which has the best outcomes in the US. Japan, of course, have had good outcomes for the last two to three decades, and then Sweden in Europe. So if you look at Iowa, they use a radiant warmer as a skincare strategy to manage fluid and electrolytes, and they end up using almost 350 ml per kilo per day. I have never used this kind of a volume before, but it's fascinating that they end up using that. And I had a quick discussion with the moderators today about the value of a, uh, a functional echo by the bedside. They constantly do functional echo to monitor their, their fluid status. In Japan, it's the other end. They use only 50 to 60 ml per kilo per day, but they go up as high as 95% humidification. It's very hard to reach 95% humidification. And if you do achieve that, you know, the whole thing gets, uh, the, the paints get all humidified that you can't even see the baby through it. And then in Sweden, they use about 80 to 100 and they use a heated uh, humidified incubator. The controversy persists, you know, remember there's no randomized control trial to decide which one is better, no large randomized control for this extreme preterm babies. So what are the advantages? If you use a humidified incubator, meaning 70 to 80% humidity the first week, and then you drop it down to 50% after the first week, that is the strategy most of them use. There is significantly less transepidermal water loss, but the drawbacks include poor visibility, limited access both to parents and staff, and then it may promote growth of bacteria, meaning there is an element of harm here. But if you manage them under a radiant warmer, which is let's say 40, 50% humidity, you have huge transepidermal water losses, but the lower ambient humidity results in more barrier formation. Remember I told you the importance of the barrier all along and the people who use radiant warmer want the barrier to be strengthened. They want this physical barrier, this innate immunity to function properly. So given this controversy, my suggestion is it is still reasonable to use an incubator with high humidity for the first week, but rapidly, rapidly drop it to 50% humidity after seven days. That's what we do. Another potential compromise is the hybrid incubators, properly, popularly known as giraffes in the USS. Essentially, it can function as both the radiant warmer and the humidified incubator. You can interchange the modes. And this is something that is now being adapted in some centers. What about the use of topical emollients? People believe that topical emollients improve barrier integrity and function, hence it's commonly used. This is commonly used in India, particularly in South India. This is a cultural practice, almost a ritual. All term babies seem to get this kind of oil massage. And in South India, uh, they, the, the, the favorite oil seems to be coconut oil. So does this coconut oil work? But before that, let me answer the question on emollients. Do topical emollients work in preterm infants? It was believed that it reduces sepsis and mortality. So there are eight trials in the Western world. Okay, but in the Western world, people used creams or ointments. Okay, the largest of that trial used Aquaphor, which is essentially Vaseline. And they showed no difference in infection or mortality. And in fact, it caused some harm. There was an increased incidence of staph and fungal infections. But however, contrary to that, in the developing world, they use plant or vegetable oils as an emollient, and they clearly show a larger number of babies. They showed that they reduced infections. However, no effect on mortality. 
We believe the reason that these emollients work is because of that semi-permeable nature I was telling you about. These oils are water permeable. It allows the water vapor to get through. And number two, these oils may inherently, the fatty acids in these oils may inherently have some antibacterial activity, particularly the coconut oil has been shown, the fatty acids in coconut oil have been shown to have antibactericidal activity. So if you look at all the coconut oil trials in preterm infants, majority of done are done in India. And the largest trial done this year, recently published, has almost 2,200 babies, or 2,300 babies. All the rest were relatively small. This and most of these trials had babies greater than 30 or 32 weeks in their trials. They use some of them, the early trials use this along with massage, but later on, no. The intervention could have lasted from just uh, five days to a month. And this one, the one in Australia involves smaller preterm babies that I'm referring to and was done in the NICU, whereas most of the other trials are done in a community setting. So remember community versus NICU, slightly bigger babies versus smaller babies. But if you put them all together and do a meta-analysis, it clearly showed that there was overall lower incidence of hospital acquired infections. It decreased the transepidermal water loss. There was better growth in terms of both, you know, uh, weight gain, better skin condition, meaning visually it looked better. And the last two trials, you know, the one from India and the one from Australia seem to suggest that they have better neurodevelopment outcomes. I think we need much larger trials to convincingly prove this. At the present time, uh, like Manoj said in the introduction, we are doing a trial in Bangalore. We are trying to look to see not only if it reduces infection, coconut oil in small babies, but also to see mechanistically at the cellular molecular level, what is it that makes the coconut oil work or anti-infective? Let's move on to look at the medical adhesive injury, which is known as Marcy. Remember I told you the cohesion between the dermis and the epidermis is not well developed. The fibrils are shorter, lesser in number and very sparse. So any baby less than, particularly less than 30 weeks is prone for epidermal stripping and skin injury. So you've all seen this kind of injury in the preterm infants. If you look, when we try to secure pick lines to uh, umbilical vessels, again here are even peripheral IVs. These kinds of injuries are known as medical adhesive related skin injuries. You're essentially stripping off the epidermis. So what is an ideal dressing? The ideal dressings should be something that is transparent that you can see through, should be water vapor permeable, meaning I said semi-permeable, and then it should be have a gentle adhesive. Okay, that also will facilitate keratinization below it or underneath the dressing. At this present time, we have two kinds of adhesives. One is known as a hydrogel adhesive, which is very popular in India. It causes less trauma and it's less trauma, it's semi-permeable, it allows the water vapor, but it's not recommended for wounds or, or injuries where you want the dressing to adhere. Whereas the other upcoming adhesive is the silicone adhesives that are available in India, and we use it more often, is probably the least traumatic and easy to remove. But the problem is we cannot use it. It doesn't stick to plastic. Hence, we cannot use it to secure NG tubes or nasal prongs or anything like that. So when you remove these dressings, also you have to be very careful and do it slowly. Some institutions use mineral oil or petrolatum to do it. But the problem is if you do that, you cannot again use that site to restick something. But now in the recent past, there are silicone based adhesive removers, which are available, which are probably the best. I'm intentionally not giving you any generic trade names. What about skin disinfectants? Do these skin infectants get absorbed and cause harm or can it cause just a chemical burn? So we've all seen this happen. This are, if you use the wrong disinfectant during uh, uh, the cleaning procedure prior to umbilical vascular catheterization, you see these kinds of burns. So as of today, we have three choices. One is chlorexidine, which is 
probably the best in terms of the spectrum of antibacterial activity and the longer duration of action. It comes in two forms, an aqueous solution, as well as it could be in an alcohol base. We are now suggesting you use chlorhexidine in an aqueous base. Then you have povidine iodine, also known as betadine. But the problem with this is that it can get absorbed and suppress the thyroid. Then lastly is the isopropyl alcohol, and which in India you refer to as spirit, which is 100%. So it's much more potent than the 70%. So whatever you use, you have to be careful, be aware of its potential side effects. We recommend using CHC only in infants greater than 28 weeks because there is some concern still that it can get absorbed through the skin. And we use povidone, iodine, and alcohol for infants less than 28 weeks. If you want to clean it, try and use sterile water. Don't use betadine first and then clean it with spirit. Try and use something which is less potent. Now coming to acid mantle development. Is this important or why is this important? This is a device here up here showing you a simple device that we use. Uh, it's a probe, we just put it on the skin surface and it tells me the skin pH. The skin pH is very critical part of the innate immune system of the neonate. It's just like the gastric pH in you and me. Right? And it also facilitates or stimulates enzymes, which are important in processing the stratum corneum lipids. So it's very important. If you don't have an acid pH, on the contrary, if you have an alkaline pH, you can have desquamation of the skin. So what is the normal pH? If you look in an adult skin, the pH of an adult skin is always acidic. It's between 5 and 5.5. The term and preterm infants at birth are alkaline. They're usually greater than six because they're exposed to the alkaline amniotic fluid. In term infants, the pH drops to less than five by three days. It's pretty efficient. But in preterms, it may take much longer time. So it depends on the gestational age. The younger they are, it takes the longer time. To so most often to decrease to 5.5, it may take a week or longer. So why is this important? Because of what we do to these babies in the NICU. We use different bathing products. Most of the cleansers or shampoos or soaps that we use have an alkaline pH, which, which will remove the skin lipids and the natural moisturizing factors and damage the preterm skin. If I ask you, if any of the neonatologists in the audience, do you know what the pH of your cleanser or detergent is in your nursery, you will not be aware of that. You want to go back and check that, and we recommend you use a mildly acidic cleanser, which is between four to six. And cleansers also should you make sure they are free of fragrances, alcohol, and some sensitizing ingredients. But more recently, you have some formulations that contain are enriched with ceramides, which they call physiological lipids because of this. Remember, I told you the Vernix had some lipids, about 20% of its lipid composition and the postnatal stratum corneum has even more, it goes up to 50%. So now the cleansers are enriched with some ceramides. So ideally you need a pH, but mildly acidic pH as well as plus minus have some ceramides. Now coming to phototherapy and extremely low birth weight babies. Is it safe and effective? We have been increasingly using phototherapy to reduce neuronal toxicity related to hyperbilirubinemia. We've become almost very casual in starting the lights on these babies. There are presumed ways that phototherapy can damage uh, even full-term neonates. The one that is uh, shown in a large epidemiological study showed that excessive phototherapy can cause dose-related DNA damage and can increase childhood cancers. But that's mainly an association there, not a cause and effect. But these are possible ways that phototherapy can cause injury. And particularly in our preterm babies who have the thinnest and the most translucent skin, all these mechanisms are exaggerated. So what is the evidence? There are only two large trials looking at the effect of phototherapy on extremely low birth weight babies. The first one was published in 1991, but the babies were enrolled in the 1970s. This trial was primarily done to look at the effectiveness of phototherapy in preterm babies, right? And then this follow-up was published six years later, at six years of age. 
And then the other one was a trial that was published in 2008. At this time, there was increasing evidence of something known as low bilirubin encephalopathy, suggesting that even lower levels of bilirubin can cause encephalopathy. So this trial tried to see if aggressive phototherapy was better than the conservative phototherapy. So what did they show? The first one showed, this is the old study where in the 1970s they enrolled, there was no difference in the primary outcome, meaning neurodevelopment that they were looking at. But if you look at the relative risk of death, there was a 30% higher risk of death for low birth weight of babies, and almost a 50% higher risk of death for extremely low birth weight babies. And on the second study, the more recent one, it did seem to improve neurodevelopmental impairment with aggressive phototherapy, but this was offset with an increase in mortality among infants by 100 to 750 grams at birth. So you have two important signals here, only two trials done, and both of them suggest that there's increased mortality. So remember as physicians, our core clinical dictum, first do no harm. And second, if possible, use the lowest effective treatment dose to reduce the risks of known and unknown hazards. So I'm trying to introduce this concept of cycled phototherapy. Essentially, you don't give continuous phototherapy, you only expose the baby for a brief period of time and then cycle it. There's new evidence just published, the references below here, suggesting that this is efficacious in removing the bilirubin, but at the same time, decreasing overall exposure to light. So at the moment, we are doing a large randomized controlled trial studying exactly this in babies less than 750 grams, and I'm the PI for, for our center. So hopefully I'll have some results for you in the next couple of years. So just to give you an idea of how our hypothesis or uh, the uh, intervention would work, let's say at 24 hours, your bilirubin is between five to 7.9 here. In the intervention arm, we cycle it, we give it for 15 minutes per hour, and the rest of the 45 minutes, it's not under lights, whereas these babies have the conventional continuous 60 minutes of phototherapy. So finally, in summary, I would like to end by saying that every day we see this immature and critical interface that we tend to ignore because it's right in front of our eyes and we are most worried about the other organ systems. But hopefully I have taken you through and shown you the importance of the skin barrier or this epithelial barrier, which is very critical. And depending on your skincare strategy that you might change a big outcome like mortality. So thank you and I'll take questions. And I'd like to offer a special thanks to my colleague, Dr. Marty Vischer, a collaborator, a mentor and a friend without whom all this would not have happened. Thank you. Thank you, sir. It was an excellent journey. I am grateful that we kept this topic in our series. There are a lot of, because this is an area where people, uh, I mean, actually hesitate to talk and say, I mean, this was one of the best sessions, I would say. Now, without wasting any time, I have the honor to invite two of the uh, great neonatologists of India. Professor Saurabh Datta is known to all of us, the, uh, uh, is from PGA Institute, the prestigious institute from Chandigarh and uh, Dr. Thananjay, another uh, clinician and a neonatologist from uh, Jaipur. So over to you, both of you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Manoj. And thank you for this opportunity to uh, moderate the session. Firstly, I must compliment Professor Narendran for an absolutely brilliant and fascinating talk. I mean, I've never heard a talk on neonatal, you know, skin physiology in preterm infants, which has been as captivating as the one you've just uh, delivered. And I'm not exaggerating. Uh, and thank you for uh, drawing everybody's attention to this much neglected organ. This is actually the largest organ in terms of surface area, uh, maybe, from apart from the inside of the of the lungs, the alveolar surface, uh, and because for some reason it's not as glamorous as the heart and the lung and the brain, it uh, seems to escape our attention. I am I'm really thankful to you for having drawn our collective attention to it. Uh, before we take on the sessions from the Q and A box, uh, I would like all the participants to kindly 
post their questions on the Q&A box and not on the chat box. And the organizers have been repeatedly saying that. Uh, I would like to ask a few questions uh, just to set the ball uh, rolling. Um, one of the, you did mention that there were attempts to make a synthetic uh, Vernix Kaziosa. Uh, firstly, how far has that attempt uh, been successful? And secondly, uh, I was looking at the composition of the Vernix, which you had shown, and it seems to be extremely complex, you know, just like how the surfactant is a very complex uh, mixture of uh, lipids and proteins. So is it possible to harness the Vernix from other mammals, like how we have done with surfactant? You know, we, have, we harness surfactant from cows and uh, pigs and other mammals. Is it possible to harness natural Vernix from other mammals and use it because uh, you know, creating a synthetic vernix may be technologically a very challenging process. Is there any move in this direction? Uh, that's the first of my you know, two or three questions. I mean, that's an excellent question. Unfortunately, I'll answer your second question first. There is no animal model which secretes vernix. Can you believe that? At least to our knowledge, we have not found some animal that has the vernix which is similar to us. So, even the animal models would be used don't have that, you know, like a mice or the pigs that don't have vernix. So the question of trying to do something similar to actually I have a slide, which I didn't show you likes, can we do this? Like from breast milk, we have formula from surfactant, we, you know, from bovine surfactant, we have synthetic surfactant. So can we do something like that? But unfortunately, no, we try, I mean, that's the, line of thinking we had, but no. Second, um, about five, almost 10 years ago, we were really heavily invested in trying to develop the synthetic vernix. Like you said, it's very challenging, you know, to get the right lipid mixture together and to add the amino acids and to formulate it. You know, all these things, it, you know, the final product, you know, depends on how you add it, what sequence in which you add and what temperature you add. So formulating something like that is very tricky. So we tried, but at the same time, a lot of, if you Google vernix creams, you can just go to Google and just do vernix creams. There are a lot of people who are selling vernix like creams, which is nothing like, but they're just, you know, branding it as Vernix because, you know, just to market it. And I, I'm assuming it is selling, but there are, if you Google Vernix creams, you'll find it, but they are nothing like the true Vernix. Okay. Um, uh, another issue, because, you know, I've been tending to work on this area in the last few years is the microbiome. Uh, I was just interested in knowing, because that's one area which I didn't see you touch upon, does the vernix have a microbiome which is there already before birth or does it, how quickly does it acquire a microbiome after birth because recent uh, uh, you know evidence tells us that you know maybe even the fetal gut which we used to believe was sterile is not sterile it acquires a microbiome before birth so does the skin also acquire a microbiome and what role does it play if at all it's there uh, at the time of birth as you know, protective role. And these genes that you mentioned, you know, which uh, the 10,000 genes that expressed, are all of them human genes and are some of them actually microbial genes that, are, that we are picking up in these uh, metagenomic uh, studies? Great, great questions again, Sarah. So the first question about microbiome. So I actually meant to say something about the role of vernix in microbiome postnatally, okay? Uh, it's a harder question in utero. The microbiome by all these, the, the vernix by altering the skin pH, you know, and you know, it alters the skin pH makes it the, uh, helps in providing the acid mantle. So that primarily influences the type of microorganisms that grow on the skin surface. So it's very important if you take a group of babies who have vernix removed and vernix retained and then look to see the microbiome, it's going to be different. So yes, it plays a role a little bit postnatally. In utero, like, you know, we always thought it was a sterile amniotic fluid, uh, the womb was sterile. You know, it's, we thought it was like the CSF or, you know, like the ventricles. 
but no longer. Like you said, we have now seen in a totally uncomplicated, we can isolate bacteria in a term infant, you know, in a, from the placenta or from the gut. So it's no longer believed, but we have not, you know, it's, uh, to do what you're trying to suggest, we have, you know, you know that amniotic fluid is contaminated to, to isolate and selectively take the vernix from the baby, which is a liquid. You know, it's like, you know, it's at body temperature, I told you it's like an oil that's flowing all over. It's kind of hard, but we never thought of that when we were doing these studies earlier on, but something to think about. I think it's a fascinating question to ask. I mean, maybe when you have your next fetal surgery being done for the meningomyelocele. Yep. Take a swab. <laughs> <laughs> no, but the problem uh, is to differentiate what's on in the amniotic fluid versus what we uh, introduced. And all. it's yeah. a little challenging, but doable, I guess. And uh, the lastly, uh, a little comment. You know, I was uh, interested when you uh, showed the slide about the bathing products and, you know, you're talking about them in India. Somehow that's not an issue at all because we don't even bathe these uh, preterm babies during their entire hospital stay, at least we don't do it in, in PGI at all. I mean, they don't get a bath at all during the entire hospital stay. And uh, a lot of parents wouldn't bathe them till they're about two kilos uh, of for weight. So, I mean, the question of using a bathing product and its pH, et cetera, uh, is a bit of a non-issue here, but, but it is interesting that, uh, you know, it's a, it is an issue at all th there. We in, in the surprised. US environment. So you don't even uh, give them a sponge bath? I mean, maybe just the, uh, you know, perineal region and uh, nothing. Otherwise, we, we don't bathe these babies. Wow. I'd like to hear what others sent. I mean, see, this is how we ignore the skin. I have been to so many NICUs in India. I've never asked them this question. So, uh, you know, the, I think it'll be fascinating to see how the, whether they do a sponge bath with sterile water or warm water. You know, you want to remove the soil. At the same time, if the baby is colonized with you know, patho pathological bacteria, presumably, then they think we made this, you know, the, 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 most people use potent cleansers because they think they're removing that. I don't believe in that, but I'm saying that's why it crept, it, crept in into the nurseries. Okay, uh, I think with that, we would uh, move on Just to Just one the, more uh, thing that, you know, we have a lot of MRSA in our units, mm -hmm. okay? um, methicillin resistant Staph aureus. So one of the strategies now proposed is to use chlorhexidine wipes, both for the mother and the, uh, both the parents, you know, prior to delivery, if you know this mother is gonna have a preterm delivery, we want them to have chlorhexidine sort of baths and then wipes because we do kangaroo care after the baby's born and the, uh, and again, the belief is that the, back, the baby is colonized with whatever is in the birth canal, that we also want to wipe the baby with the CHG wipe. Is that as the new thing in neonatology and trying to reduce early onset sepsis? I'm not a believer in that, but I just wanted to tell you that is, even, that is the other extreme, that as soon as the baby is born, we want to remove all the bacteria, but the problem is you also remove the commensals, which are probably yeah. more important. Right. So, but I just wanted to bring that up to say, you know, the, the pendulum has swung the other end that we want to wipe the baby and the parents. Okay. Uh, with that, we'll take the questions which are in the Q&A box. I'll start with the first few questions and then I will hand over to my co-moderator, uh, Dr. Dhananjay, at some point of time. So the first question is from Jacqueline McKinta. It's actually related to the same bathing issue. So her question is, how soon, how soon should the newborn baby be bathed? That's the question. So I think the WHO says six to eight hours later. So, uh, but I would say delaying it up to 12 hours, unless it's obviously contaminated with blood or meconium, you can delay it. The vernix seems to get absorbed into the skin surface. Okay. Um, Dr. Dinakar from Bangalore uh, asked this question that uh, if we keep our hand or any part of our body in water, it starts wrinkling and becomes pale and peels away easily. And you did mention that the vernix prevents that phenomenon from happening. But his question is that why doesn't it happen in a premature baby before the vernix has developed adequately? Premature baby, when it comes out, doesn't have a wrinkled skin. I think that's what he's trying to say. 
Correct. I mean, there is, in, in other words, there are the wrinklings because of the, out, the epidermis, the outermost layer, okay? That's the, the stratum corneum absor absorbing the water, but that's not even there. So you don't see it. There must be something to wrinkle. So the whole epidermis is like a thin, even in you and me is like 100 microns. It's like a sheet of paper. And if you take a preterm baby, that's not there. So you can't see it. It's not there at all. It's, there's nothing for you to, uh, you know, but, and then obviously there's the sebaceous secretions are forming around, you know, I told you around 16 weeks of gestation. There is something there, but it's not visible. There's no visible vernix. Actually in my slide presentation, the fetus that I showed you, which had vernix, had obvious vernix, that baby looked as though he was 24 weeks or something. Mm -hmm. So obviously there is something, but not obviously visible. So uh, the next question is from Aditi Day. Um, she says that the preterm skin is at risk for skin injury with a lot of medical uh, things being stuck onto the skin. So what products are available that deliver both skin protection like vernix and skin repair? I'm not sure whether she's asking for whether, you know, what commercial products or brand names or whatever, but what, you know, and what generic products are available that would protect the skin similar to vernix and would help to repair the skin? At the moment, there is nothing, nothing currently available, but I think the trend is to have a dressing or a cream which is enriched with ceramides. So if you can look at any product within India which says enriched with truly, really ceramides, not, not just a marketing gimmick, then I would probably use that and uh, the brand names or trade names here are entirely different from what you are used to in India. So I would not even, you know, uh, try and pick some for you. Okay. Uh, on her next question is, uh, what are your thoughts on advancing skin ker keratinization in the periviable infant by limiting humidification and giving as much fluids as needed to compensate for the insensible losses? Yeah, that is a valid, uh, you know, um, thought and a lot of units do that. But for people who are trained, uh, you know, uh, many years ago to give a newborn baby 350 ml per kilo per day at 800 gram or six as, I mean, a 500, 600 gram baby is huge. And you need to monitor that fluid and electrolyte status pretty closely if you're giving that amount of, you know, like I told you, the Iowa Center does, you know, three times a day, they do functional echo to look, measure the fluid status. It is probably the right thing to do if you have all the, uh, you know, uh, uh, right equipment and the facilities to do all this, you know, if you have the talented people who can do echo at the bedside, you know, measure your fluid and electrolytes at least twice a day, and you can pull that off. And it clearly low humidity has been shown to help in uh, barrier maturation. And uh, that center uses it all the time. And uh, we are still using the humidified incubator. So, so what, what is the biology behind that? I mean, how is it that uh, lowering the humidity helps with the barrier maturation? I'm actually not fully sure. We are not clearly sure of why it does it. I'm not sure how, what, what mechanisms it provokes. We haven't looked at that. I mean, is, is it a stress-related thing that uh, like it how is, surfactant it, it production is. kicks in when, uh, because it of is postnatal stress. stress, something like that? But what, you know, we don't know mechanistically what is it that stimulates the lipids to suddenly start, you know, being overexpressed, mm -hmm. you know, uh, the low humidity. You know, the low humidity happens in full-term babies as well, right? So, you know, yeah. I told you from a wet environment, the baby comes into this dry, low humidity and the barriers starts maturing pretty quickly postnatally. It does happen, but I don't know mechanistically how it happens. Um, there's a question from uh, Dr. Avnesh Amiti, which is very similar to one asked earlier, so I'm not going to go over it. I mean, about the skin wrinkling, which you've already answered. Dr. Srijana asks, uh, how is Marcy best treated? That's the question. I was, I was hoping- I mean, if there's a patient who has Marcy in your unit, how would you go about treating? So that's, uh, like I told you, you want to use something which is trans addressing. There are different kinds of dressings. 
I'll tell you the uh, core elements of that dressing. And you can go find a product in your own country, wherever you are. So we are all still in our own country. We are still in the US. We are still debating what's the right dressing. When do we use it? You know, for example, if you have a 23 weeker on day one, do we need something to protect the skin? Meaning, do we apply a dressing? Like, you know, people have tried putting a tegaderm, for example, right? But we don't, that adhesive is a little more stronger. So we want to do something, a some dressing which has, which is transparent, which has a silicone adhesive, meaning it's easy to remove, plus minus have something that may facilitate keratinization, meaning some enrichment with ceramides and should be easily removable. Again, the silicone adhesive as well as a silicone uh, remover, silicone-based remover can be used. And we have four or five things. We are the, I don't want to throw in the trade names here, but that we use in our NICUs, but we are not fully convinced that one is better than the other at this point in time. We are still trying to evaluate. We're taking images, you know, periodically to see if it is because, you know, um, there are no randomized controlled trials, obviously. So it's, there is almost a belief or a myth that, yay, this dressing works better than that. So we need to get beyond this myth and bias to actually show that, yep, this particular dressing works better than the other one. So in, but in general, you want something which is water permeable, meaning semi-permeable, transparent, doesn't have a strong adhesive and may have something that can facilitate keratinization. Okay. I'll take just one more question and then I'll have, ha, hand over to Dr. Dhananjay after that. So this question is from Dr. Raj Gupta asks that, you know, when you were talking about the slightly increased mortality on giving aggressive phototherapy to ELBW infants. So how do we tease out whether it was the higher bilirubin that they may have had for which you had to give the aggressive phototherapy that was causing the increased mortality or was it the phototherapy itself? Well, and, ideally the just high bilirubin should not cause increased mortality, right? So bilirubin can cause neurotoxicity and by the time it causes mortality, the levels are pretty high. But here we're talking about aggressive and conservative phototherapy on day one to day three, day four, after 24 hours, the first few days. And then we have corrected the results for all the known confounders which can affect mortality. So it's been corrected for that. But we are looking at a bilirubin of six or eight Right, so uh, unlikely that the bilirubin itself contributed, but we corrected for all those things in those trials. And these were randomized controlled trials. Randomized so controlled one assumes trials, that right. everything other than the Both intervention was, you know, what was equally balanced at the trial. Right. And very well done randomized controlled trials. Yes. Yeah. Uh, I would hand over to Dr. Dhananjay now. Dr. Dhananjay, thank could you come in? Yeah. Thank you, sir. And uh, first of all, I would say uh, thank you for great presentation by Dr. Vivek. It's a great uh, in-depth knowledge regarding this preterm skin. So uh, next question is from Simi. Excellent session. So, sir, would you suggest applying a moisturizer oil on a ELBW in the stable phase of growth? I, if you really want to apply something, I would apply a oil, something like a coconut oil, okay? But I would not encourage using olive oil or safflower oil. If, if you want to use something, use coconut oil, probably has the most evidence, okay? And we try and do it only below the neck, even in NICU babies. Like there are some NICUs in Bangalore that they routinely do this. So, so uh, uh, this, um... Coconut oil is to be applied throughout the body, not on the face. Why is it so? We don't know whether it can get into your eyes or you know if it gets into the mucous membrane and causes anything. It's safer at this point in time, so just apply it below the neck. But I'm I'm sure. I mean, we apply it for full term babies on the face, head, neck, everywhere, right? In India, everybody gets all over the face. But just because we're talking about extremely low birth weight base, probably on a ventilator, who's got tubes and all that, you know, you don't know where it'll go. So try to avoid that because you have all these invasive devices. I think your next question is uh, related to the same. Any experience with the sunflower seed oil for massage? So is there any experience? Uh, any what? Sorry, Dhananjay? Is there any personal experience regarding the use of the sunflower seed oil for massage? No. 
no personal experience has been used in the community, particularly in Bangladesh, Nepal, India, and they found good results in the community, not in the NICU. Okay. Our next question from Ginny. Is there any vernix preparation available for use? You have already mentioned in your talk that some vernix preparation are available, whether it's a really vernix or not. So it's probably not. Uh, next question with the genie is how frequently can we apply coconut oil to babies? Will it be beneficial to buy skin with water before applying coconut oil or directly add coconut oil to apply? In the current trial we're doing, we directly apply it on day one. Right? So we take baseline measurements, we're doing some biophysical measurements and we do sample the stratum corneum and then we apply on day one. So we apply it twice a day because we think we, if you like take, for example, five ml per kilo and do it in the morning at 8 a.m. and then at 8 p.m. And can this uh, coconut oil is to be used during babies under phototherapy? Yes, it's been shown to be safe. Good question. So in all the other questions that you asked about different dressings that we have to use for the babies, we have to make sure that phototherapy can go through that dressing, right? When she was asking about medical uh, the MRC, medically uh, adhesive related skin injury, the same question holds good. So you had mentioned in uh, your talk that Bernix is an anti infector or antimicrobial activity. So next question is from uh, Venkatesh Rao. What is the role of the Bernix to cure resistant ulcer? Is there any role in that too? People have not used it for ulcers, but they have, people have used it for episiotomy wounds. So, you know, if you ask your old midwives or old nurses and, you know, who practiced many years ago, they used to take the baby's vernix and put it on the episiotomy wound, believing that it will heal. And it has antimicrobial effects, like using an antibiotic uh, cream. So, but there's no, you know, people have not studied it, but these are all, you know, things that have been tried. So, uh, is another related question is this, uh, whether we can keep warnings in uh, C2 for next 24 hours in spite of BIPOF immediately after the birth? So you can collect the warnings, but remember it is uh, a body fluid. So it's an infectious material. So it can have bacteria or viruses. It can have everything. But if you ask if it's the components are, uh, of warnix, can you preserve it? then we have to immediately take it and put it in a minus 80 degree freezer. And we have done that for experimentation, for experiments, but not for any clinical use. But the biggest concern is you have to somehow sterilize it without affecting all these peptides, right? It's like the same questions when we use donor breast milk, right? Does the pasteurization affect all the good molecules that the breast milk has, right? It just suddenly destroys the proteins in it. And the anti you know, it, even breast milk has lysozyme and lactoferrin. I don't think donor breast milk has that. Similarly, I can't take this and then try to sterilize it and expect it to function like native vernix. One question is from Anisha. He just said to start prophylactic phototherapy in your babies, but phototherapy can even cause mortality. So, what should be protocol to be followed in EL babies? At the outset. Please continue doing whatever you do, the, conserv the continuous conservative phototherapy, okay? We, I just wanted to, you know, give you some insights into what is, you know, the future. And I don't want you to change your practice. Continuous phototherapy is the way to go now. There is no role of prophylactic phototherapy, meaning your bilirubin has to come to the skin surface, you know, unless the baby has, is looking yellow, there's no point putting the baby under phototherapy, right? So there's, the concept of prophylactic phototherapy is certainly not in extremely low birth weight babies. Even in term babies, we discourage that, okay? But if you are, if the baby is jaundice, yeah, go ahead and do it. But don't do it because it's not going to work. There has to be bilirubin in the skin. And the question is, the other thing that is fascinating is while Saurabh was asking questions, where is the bilirubin in the skin? We don't know. Where is it? You know, I'm trying to figure out where in the skin it is. It's, you know, the vasculature is all in the dermis, right? It's a very fascinating physiology by itself. Same uh, question in continuation asked by a version. This type of phototherapy matters regarding the skin safety, whether it's a lead lamp or something different. The new LED ones are seems to be better, are safer. LED phototherapy lights than the traditional fluorescent kind of lights. But otherwise, no. 
overall shouldn't make a difference. Okay. The next question is from Mr. Gothami. Does application of oil to preterm babies increase fungal sepsis? Oils, no, but if you use Vaseline in extremely low birth weight babies in a small trial, it did increase candida. But in the big trial, uh, it's called the Vermont Oxford trial, it increased staph epidermidis. Okay. Uh, same question repeats since vernix can be used for the wound healing, can we use newborn's baby's vernix for healing wound of the baby of face more than one month? So it's the same answer already you have given. Next uh, question being asked by the Sarainia. Is there any evidence for the use of the neoreps during the first few days of the life in units which do not have incubators? We tried using them and our results, especially with regards to weight loss and uh, fluid valence have been good. So she is asking, I think, is there any evidence to use of the neoreps? What's new wraps? I think uh, Vivek, that's the same as saran wraps. Oh, oh. So okay. you know those okay. cling wraps, yes. which are stretched across the right. sides right. of a radiant bone. Okay. Yes. To create it, a micro environment. Yes, it does reduce transepidermal water loss by providing humidity. So whenever you have the environmental humidity is high, your transepidermal water loss decreases. Yes, it does help. Okay. That's again in the delivery room. You know, we put them in plastic bags as well, right, to conserve heat. Plastic bag. You know, controls heat in different mechanisms. It reduces all kinds of all the four ways that you lose, uh, lose heat. You know, the convective, evaporative, everything. The, the plastic bag in the delivery room, but the saran wrap here is mainly just reduces the convective heat loss. Most of the questions. I, I hate to interrupt. Actually, can I ask uh, Professor Vivek uh, Narendran how much time more he has because he and I am aware this is a working day and the morning and how we have to rush uh, from home to uh, work. So how much time more we have? Probably five more minutes. I didn't realize the time was already, you know, 11.30 here for me, but I've been Since enjoying The time you have given me is up. That's why yeah. I asked the question. No, no, I'm enjoying it. Let's do it for five more minutes and then I'll run. Great. Okay, great. So next question is from uh, Pradeep. Can we smear probiotics simply to apply it over skin to create a healthy microbiome rather than using products you didn't wipes to remove pathogen as well as the commercials? These are all good questions, but they're all speculations. There's no evidence, but people have done something known as to facilitate a good microbiome. They try to do something called as vaginal seeding. They want to, you know, they take a swab, for example, I'm simplifying it from the, you know, from the birth canal and then apply it to the baby to make sure that the baby has you know, the commensals in the vagina, you know, which is all the lactobacilli and all that, which are probably more beneficial. So, but this is called uh, microbial seeding, which is not recommended at this time because you never know what pathological bacteria are there too. So, but it's being tried. This is called seeding the newborn to facilitate uh, uh, the kind of microbiome that you want. And the next question is from Dinesh. Uh, Monica honey of any use in the Marcy? So what's Monica honey? Um, it's I'm assuming yes. It's we have something known as similar product known as Medi honey. It's basically honey for medical purposes. So honey for some reason seems to have some barrier uh, recovery properties, antibacterial properties. Even in India, people strongly believe that honey has some protective uh, properties and uh, honey never goes bad. You know, if you put honey outside, you never see bacteria growing in it, right? If you keep honey in a bottle, you can use it after five years, nothing grows in that. So there is something in it. So it's fascinating that honey has. So we have actually used, when you have erosions in this preterm babies, we have actually used this Medi honey and it seems to work very well. So I'm kind of a believer of this Medi honey. Uh, but remember, honey also has this, can have botulinum, uh, botulinum you know, spores. So that's one of the side effects. But just merry honey is something that, so don't go use raw honey is what I'm trying to. Yeah. yeah. And one question uh, asked Hasta, can we use barrier film spray like Cavillion, which has been used in our NIC also before applying adhesive on the skin? So is this safe or? 
it, it is safe. People have tried to do that. But again, you need to, like I said, monitor and see it works. Just because I use, you know, people use multiple layers, for example. Okay, you first put another sort of a protective layer, then put another ointment, which has some other function, then cover it up with another one, which will keep the second one in place and things like that. Mm -hmm. But you need, whatever you do in your own units, you want to make sure that what you did, at least watch for three or five babies and monitor it. And just don't believe that what you're doing is correct because it's not going to be easy to do a randomized control trial. You know, one barrier versus the other barrier, it's going to be hard. In day-to-day -day practice, it's a very, very common question being asked by the most of the parents, which is being raised by the Rita. Uh, what is the, your opinion regarding use of the commercial wipes to clean babies? Many parents use them now. Okay, all right. So um, the question is in, in whether should we just use, like in, we use uh, cloth and water in India, right? Is, and there are something called water wipes, and then you have this commercial wipes. So the evidence is that if you use the right commercial wipe, like I told you the importance of the acid mantle, these wipes have an acid pH. So presumably when you clean the soil or the stool, do you what you what remains behind is after you leave it you leave an acidic skin behind which is different when you use water right so the evidence is yep this commercial wipes seem to be better in terms of restoring you back to an acid skin ph right so uh, yep there is some evidence to say that these wipes are better compared to water wipes compared to traditionally just cloth and water can I just butt in, uh, Vivek? Uh, these uh, regarding pH, uh, what is the pH of these adhesives that we use, whether they are silicone adhesives or? Good question. I never thought about it. Good question. <laughs> Let me look into it. Good question. We have never looked at that. It's, it should be easy to check that. Mm -hmm. And easy for companies to yep. maybe alter uh, and, and make it 5.5. Correct. Correct. It'll be great if they can do that. Um, so we are trying to work with most of the companies that deal with adhesives are companies which do colostomy bags, for example. Yeah. You know, though that's where the injury, the addition becomes important. Otherwise, in the adult world, it's not so important. So, you know, unless you're a diabetic foot and some dressings and all that. Other than that, but, but constantly reusing an adhesive, dressing the same site, worrying about skin injury is the colostomy site. So most of this coloplast kind of companies are the ones who are really interested in this. So we are trying to work with them uh, to see if they can, but we never, we only were talking about the mildness of the ADC. We never thought of the, of the pH. Good point, Basal. And you have a pH beta, you showed that. Yeah, you yes. Probably put it on it and find out. <laughs> okay, back to Dhananjay. Uh, thank you, sir. And next question is very uh, common whether application of breast milk can decrease sepsis rate on preterm. So as it is an analogy of the vernix, so can we use as a um, milk, breast milk uh, in, uh, for the applications better of this on, on the skin? It's, it's, uh, it's very similar. Like, you know, the mammary gland is also from the skin, okay? So by the skin, by the way, are all ectodermal derivatives. So it's like the mammary gland, the central and peripheral nervous system, the skin are all ectodermal derivatives, okay? So the mammary gland is like any other sort of eccrine gland, like it's like a sweat gland or sebaceous gland. So it's very, very similar analogy, the mammary gland and the sebaceous gland. That's where vernix is, right? Sebum. So it's very, very similar. They have pretty similar uh, properties, very similar properties. But, you know, I mean, breast milk is now used for everything to mouth care to re reduce... Uh, ventilator associated pneumonias. They are trying to use it to reduce uh, conjunctivitis. I mean, uh, they're trying to use it to reduce neck, right? We use breast milk for everything. So kind of similar, but it's not easy to get vernix. Thank you. Uh, next question is raised by Ginny. At zinc oxide containing creams are applied for perinatal diaper rash. What is the better for adhesive induced skin injury? Zinc oxide or antibiotic and, uh, ointment? So avoid antibiotic-based antibiotic creams, okay? Avoid antibiotics unless there is an obvious, you know, there's a rash, you know, in a vesicle or a pustule, 
you're worried about a bacterial infection. But if you think it's a diaper contact dermatitis, then you want to use either, you just need a barrier like, you know, either a zinc oxide or a petrolatum, which is Vaseline kind of thing, cream is way better than an antibiotic cream, right? And sometimes we get fungal infections, right? Candida, where we use nystatin or whatever. So no, I would suggest using one of these and most of the commonly available creams are a combination of these two. They'll have, you know, some proportion of Vaseline and some proportion of uh, zinc oxide and, and some other, you know, compound. Most of them, if you look at the ingredients, the proportions may vary. Uh, next question is from Mr. Thomas. Are there any new generation ECG electrodes which reduce skin injury in extreme preterm babies? No, this is another fascinating area because you need the skin to be perturbed, meaning, you know, what, you know, adults, if you see, you actually disrupt the skin, you scratch it before you put the electrodes. To have this electrical conductance, if you have an intact, completely nice skin, you can't do it. So you have to abrade the skin. If you remember, you know, how you abrade before you put monitors. So no, you actually want the skin to be abraded a little bit. So I don't think we are getting into smoother electrodes, but good point. For the con electrical conductivity is different across intact skin. So this very common question is saying, which is the best for the cracked nipples? Which is well asked by Jimmy. Well, that's another area where we have put breast milk to vernix to everything, yeah. <laughs> Uh, so, which again, some form of lanolin petrolatum is a some simple thing that commonly used, but there are so many products in the market. If you just Google crack nipples, you'll get a bunch of products. But interesting is both vernix and breast milk have been used. And one question is, what is the treatment of the calcium extravasation in skin injuries being asked by Ashok? So what is the treatment for the calcium? The best treatment is avoid infusing calcium in the first few days of life, okay? Best. There is no specific treatment, but sometimes we inject hyaluronidase. We inject hyaluronidase around the extravasation site, okay? But if it's an inotrope like epinephrine or something, then we have phentolamine that we do. Uh, but more often it's hyaluronidase only if it's a bad extra calcium extravasation. But the best thing is these babies don't need it in the first three, four days, don't give it. And last question is, what is your take on nursing ALV in food grade plastic, uh, plastic bags to prevent ELBW and to prevent trans, uh, uh, water loss? Say that again about food grade plastic bags. So what is your take on nursing ELV in food grade part, uh, plastic bags to prevent ELV uh, to prevent uh, Heat trans, loss. Uh, epidermal uh, water loss? Yeah, it's been popularly used in the delivery room. I don't know about this food grade, what it means in your setup, but uh, I, I'm presuming it is clean and you know bacteria free. So, uh, so it, it, it is very good. It's, we use it all the time. We use some kind of uh, plastic wrap as soon as the babies are born in the delivery room all the time. Okay. So this is all about, I think uh, your, uh, your uh, talk and uh, uh, answers we get from uh, your knowledge and wisdom. So really very uh, astonished to learn from so many things, which is really it's a uh, in-depth knowledge and experience uh, shown with your talk. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Very, thank you very much for your great talk. Thank uh, you, Dhananjay. Thank you, Saurabh and Manoj. Uh, thank you, Vivek, uh, once thank again, you. fascinating thank talk. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you so much, uh, Thananjay and Professor Saurabh for uh, uh, having moderated this session well. As uh, is remarked by everyone, this is one of the best talks we had thanks to uh, the in-depth knowledge into which uh, uh, Professor Vivek Narendra had gone into and the describing things. And it was so interesting that, I mean, we are overshooting time and uh, it is, uh, uh, thank you so much, sir, for uh, joining us despite your busy schedule we hope to again see you after three weeks in our uh, national conference so thank you so much and at the, before, we close, before we before we